Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock, episode 167. This week the questions are taken from guide 221 on HMS Devastation and the accompanying Wednesday video on the fight between his, at the time, Majesty's frigates Indefatigable and Amazon against the French ship of the line Droit de l'Homme, an indefatigable contest as I so obviously wittingly named the video. Marcus McCormack asks, How effective would musket fire be to enemy ships during the Age of Sail? I can't help but feel that it would only add to the noise, smoke and confusion. It could be startlingly effective, because remember, I mean, muskets aren't the longest range weapons in the world, so if you're having a distant cannonade you're really not going to be using muskets. And there isn't a kind of an intermediate close range. When you get into close range with cannon armed ships of the line etc in the age of sail you are talking properly close range as in you could probably reach out and throw something to the other ship if you had a decent throwing arm range or closer if everyone had decided to board because that kind of slightly odd intermediate range didn't really serve anybody any particular good now once you were in close range combat muskets could be very effective there's a reason well there's many reasons why marines of various flavors were carried on various ships but sharpshooting was one of them and yes you can in fact do sharpshooting with a musket if you have poorly cast ammunition or variable qualities of powder or a poorly made musket or all three then yeah the musket can be as horrifically inaccurate as it's mimetically held to be but at these relatively short ranges and with a decent quality of both weapon, ammunition and powder, you could be fairly accurate with muskets. I mean, as you can see in this picture, just ask Admiral Nelson what happens when somebody with a half-decent musket is waiting around in the ship's fighting tops to pick off key targets. So this would be the main task, basically sniping and counter-sniping. Because the rate of fire of musketry um, on land, let alone in a, on a moving ship, is relatively low. So you're probably not going to be clearing the decks unless it's a very small scale engagement with musket fire. Apart from anything else, if you start to be relatively effective, the people with muskets on the ship you're firing at are probably going to start shooting back at you. But what you could do is pretty much exactly what happened to Nelson, which is take out key targets. Helmsmen, admirals, captains, masters of the ship, chief gunners, etc. Anyone who has an organisational leadership role, you can go after them. And of course, in theory, the soldiers who are trying to shoot back at you as well. So it could be pretty effective. It's not something that's going to sink the ship, obviously. Uh, it's not going to get through the ship's sides. But it can help thin out both the numbers of people and the number of key people on the upper deck, at which point that can make both the handling of the ship generally somewhat less effective than it otherwise would be. And more specifically, if you're about to launch a boarding action, it allows you to pick off key targets of leadership that might help organise the counter boarding effort. Or indeed, if you've already done that or you can't see those, help you take out some of the marines and such like who would be your first line of defence against a boarding effort. So they, they can be pretty useful and there's a reason that there were enough, that those kind of weapons were carried aboard ships in fairly large quantities aside from forming naval brigades. Smiling Nid asks, what is the difference between a frigate and the ship of the line? Where is the line drawn? Aside from Razes, were there ships that towed the line between the two? It varies over time quite considerably. Initially, the term frigate or frigate built simply means a ship that has been built more for speed and handling than it has for durability and gunpower. So you could have what you might later call a ship of the line that is also called a frigate, more, probably more accurately at that point, a great frigate. But by the end of the initial run of Frigate, before it was fell into disuse and then was eventually resurrected in the Second World War, a Frigate had come to being a ship with a single gun deck, which is why HMS Warrior, despite being an ironclad battleship by every other possible metric, was initially described as a Frigate, purely on the grounds that it had a single gun deck. But more generally speaking, the difference 
is kind of inherent to the second name, the ship of the line. A ship of the line was a ship that the power in question that owned it considered to be fit for the purpose of standing in the line of battle, i.e. it had the size, the crew, the durability, and the firepower to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with pretty much anything the enemy could throw at it, at least for a short amount of time. I mean, no one expected a third rate to come off victorious in a fight with a first rate, but you would expect a third rate to withstand a few salvos from the first rate, which would give it time either to break off or for friends to come and assist. Whereas a frigate could be expected to be reduced to a smouldering wreck by a single salvo from a larger ship of the line, which indeed did happen on occasion. Now, where exactly that line sits, again, varies during the Age of Sail. For example, the fourth rate, or the 64 gunner, and sometimes even as low as a 50 gunner, was considered a ship of the line in the earlier part of what we might consider to be the classic Age of Sail. But the 50 gunner very rapidly fell out of that category. And so when you end up with 50 gunners later on, like, say, HMS Leopard in its famous encounter with a US frigate, it's by that point rated as a frigate. Then you get up to the full on fourth rates, the 64 gunners. For a very long time, the 64 gunner, whilst a little small, is still seen as a ship of the line. But by Nelson's career period, they're beginning to fall out of use. Some 64s are razade, other 64s are still technically used in the line of battle, like Nelson's own Agamemnon, but they're becoming a vanishingly rare vessel because the between the size of the battery in terms of numbers and the size of the battery in terms of the weight of shot of the guns, they were beginning to be seen as not quite fit for purpose. Most 64s generally would have a main battery deck of 24 pounders, whereas a 74 would have a main battery deck of 32 pounders as a rule of thumb. And so over time, during pretty much during Nelson's career, the 74 gunner, at least in the Royal Navy, became the standard minimum price of entry to be a ship of the line. By the time of the end of the Age of Sail, the two decker, which was another informal name for a third rate, had gone up to 90 guns so exactly where that line is as i say would vary perhaps decade on decade but generally speaking there would usually be a few ships that were towing the line but they would generally be the older ships that had been ships of the line previously and were now in the process of being outclassed because unless you happen to be in a very niche situation like the u.s navy you wouldn't normally build a frigate to ship of the line standards because that would slow it down and you wouldn't definitely wouldn't build a ship of the line to frigate standards because that would render it too weak and not durable enough to stand up to combat with us ships like the six frigates they're sometimes built said to have been built as if they were ships of the line that's not technically true they were built similarly to ships of the line in that they had slightly thicker hull planking, the hull frames were closer spaced together, so they were more heavily built than frigates, that much is true. However, they were not built fully to the same kind of specification as you might find on a third-rate ship of the line, for the very good reason that the US ship architects realised that if they did do that, and you built effectively a pocket ship of the line, that that would sacrifice a lot of the speed and manoeuvring capability that was inherent to the rest of the design they were building, which was, after all, a very large, very very well-rigged frigate. So that, I think, probably needs to be cleared up. Something like USS Constitution has a hull, and in terms of the hull planking and the hull framing, that is considerably stronger and more durable than the average frigate that you would find, but it is not in the same weight class as something like Lorient or Santissima Trinidad or HMS Victory. Um, it is more fragile than those. DJC988 asks, How does the man main battery of Bismarck, Richelieu and Roma stack up when compared against each other, excluding propellant and faulty shells? Each gun battery has a couple of things to recommend it and some things that are against it excluding the propellant and shells issues. The Italian 
battery on the Littorio class, for instance, it has one more gun than though batteries of Bismarck and Richelieu, 9 versus 8. It also has guns that fire the 15-inch shell at absolutely hilarious speeds, and because kinetic energy is half mv squared, the increase in velocity has a significantly more marked effect on the overall kinetic energy than uh, the in increasing the mass of the shell will do, at least at closer ranges. As a result of which, over any reasonable World War One era battle range, the Italian 15-inch gun has an absolutely hilarious amount of penetration for its size, and also can go an absolutely hilarious distance, given, you know, the fact that it's quote-unquote only a 15-inch gun in a conflict where people usually look to 16- and 18-inch guns as the final arbiters. The French guns, obviously, they're all concentrated in a forward battery, so they can fire all eight guns directly forward and across the entire forward arc, whereas the other two classes are restricted to six guns for the Italians and four guns for the Germans in direct forward ahead uh, firing situations. And they carry the greatest amount of explosive in their bursting charges, so a French 15-inch shell that hits and penetrates its target will do a bit more damage to the target than an Italian or German 15-inch shell that accomplishes the same feat. Bismarck's main battery in theory has the best all-around firepower since it can cover its aft angles with four guns, whereas the French can't cover them with any and the Italians only with three, plus Again, in theory, assuming everything works properly, the Bismarck's guns have the highest theoretical possible rate of fire, thanks to an ammunition hoist system that, if it doesn't break down, will deliver shells and charges pretty darn quickly. Each obviously does have a number of weaknesses. For example, the breech design of the German guns means that Bismarck's twin 15-inch turrets are hilariously large for, their, for the fact they're twin turrets, which means that the overall size and shape of the turret is relatively inefficient compared to the quadruple and triple turrets used by the French and the Italians when it comes to the amount of space taken up for the firepower that's given. The Italian armour-piercing shells have a remarkably small bursting charge, so individually unlikely to do quite as much damage unless they hit something vital as the French or German shells, plus they did have to dial back the muzzle velocity both to improve accuracy, at least somewhat, um, and also they have a hilariously short barrel life. Now for Italy that's not so much of a problem, but for someone like Germany or France that might be more of an issue. And the French guns, in a case that's pretty much opposite to the German guns, find themselves in a position of, until after World War II, having relatively slow shell hoist systems, plus of course the fact that with their main batteries concentrated in two turrets it would be theoretically possible to knock out half the ship's main armament with a single hit. Now fair enough, they did divide up the turrets to the point that they were almost two twin turrets in very close formation each, but that internal bulkhead could, and in some cases was, at least partially breached, which might save the crew in the other half of the turret, but wouldn't necessarily leave any of that quad turret operational. But overall, if you gave me a choice of the three, I'd be tempted just about, assuming, as we said in the question, that propellant and faulty shell issues are corrected for, to favour the Italian main battery just fractionally over the French and German battery. I would favour over the German battery in favour of the efficiency that it represents versus the monstrous size of the German twin turrets, and compared to the French battery, I get an extra gun and slightly greater range. As we've said, there are offsets to that, but in a pinch, I'd take the Littorio main battery over the other two. Charlie Bush asks, Do you think the reputation of Royal Navy carriers in World War II as good hulls, but with lacklustre air groups, is fairly earned? Also, what could the Admiralty have done to improve carrier capability and operations? I don't think it's entirely fairly earned. Now, obviously, it can't be denied that Royal Navy armoured carriers with the armoured flight decks, as compared to Japanese and American carriers of the same time period, couldn't carry quite as many aircraft, and some of those aircraft were 
less capable than their opponents in the Pacific campaign, or indeed some of their allies. However, just taking that in isolation, as I've said several times before, doesn't, I think, do justice to either the Royal Navy's carriers and their flight groups, or indeed does a fair comparison with the Japanese and American flight groups. I won't go over the points again in extreme detail because pretty much all of these have been covered in other dried up questions, but to collect them all together, the Royal Navy's flight groups have a capability that the US and Japanese navies don't have, period, at the beginning of the war, and the Americans only acquire in any numbers at all towards the very latter part of the war which is night strike capability which in some ways obviates a lot of the other weaknesses in their carrier air groups because well if you're flying in at night the enemy can't send fighters to shoot you down and most uh, enemies also don't have any particularly decent night anti-aircraft capability at which point the fact that the swordfish is not as capable as an avenger or a kate is somewhat less relevant you also have environmental conditions. The Royal Navy carriers are operating a lot in the North Sea and the North Atlantic, and in those environments, deck parking is pretty much impossible if you want to keep your aircraft for any length of time. When they were operating in calmer waters in the Pacific, where there were typhoons could be a bit of a problem, and they were able to then use deck parking, the amount of aircraft that the Royal Navy could carriers could carry per per ship did in fact increase now again because of the armored flight deck because of the weight and positions imposed on that they were never going to carry as many as their immediate contemporaries or close enough to contemporaries which for most of the royal navy carriers would be the yorktowns not the essexes but still it's a lot closer to what a yorktown could take up take from its flight deck as operational aircraft than you would think just looking at the initial stated figures in some books. And finally, a point that I've mentioned several times, due to when the war started, the Royal Navy was stuck with basically its 1937-1938 iteration of aircraft. And the 19, in 1937 and 1938, the Royal Navy's air groups, whilst again somewhat smaller than others, were actually quite competitive with Japanese and American air groups. The difference being the Royal Navy was then locked into a war, which meant that effectively production and development because of uh, the Battle of Britain got halted for a while, which meant they were left a little bit behind when it came to 1941-42, when the Americans and Japanese got involved, which had then had two and a half years of additional technological development to push their aircraft along the lines. It's very easy to compare a wildcat or a zero to a full mar and say ah oh, yes well the fleet arm clearly got it wrong i think people would be having somewhat different tunes if it was a navalized gullwing spitfire that we were comparing the wildcat and the zero to because that or something very similar to that is what was most likely going to be the royal navy's main carrier-based fighter for the generation of aircraft contemporaneous with the F4F and the A6M. So basically, whilst there is cert a certain amount of truth to it, given the actual operational environments of World War II, it, there is a considerable amount of reasoning and circumstance behind it that goes a little bit beyond, and in some cases significantly beyond, the standard easy and, to be honest, somewhat lazy narrative of ha-ha, British were so far behind glorious Pacific battling carriers that you see expressed in some locations. As far as what the Admiralty could have done to improve their carrier capability or operations, to be honest, either building more Ark Royals earlier in the 1930s although how survivable an Ark Royal type carrier would be in the Mediterranean environment that sorely tested the survivability of the armoured carriers is a little bit open to question, but certainly a couple of them wouldn't have hurt. And to be honest, the only other thing would have been to skip the Albacore and go from the Swordfish to a monoplane, well in the Royal Navy's case probably combination torpedo dive bomber, something like the Barracuda rather than go with the albacore which was a little bit of a or should we say a misstep everything else that you can point to 
better aircraft, uh, larger carriers, etc., were all either on the design tape board or sacrificed as part of the thing, the things that you have to give up when it comes to war and you're being stretched every which way from Sunday. The other thing, which would require a little bit more of a kind of a reach back through time to inform them, would be to take something along the lines of how the Malta class were going to be designed with a partially opened ha or partially open hangar deck and impose upon them the idea of maybe having larger height single hangers. Um, but both of those things would be, I say, invoking a little bit of uh, hindsight and time travel. But those would definitely help if they were implemented. Eamon asks, should the Royal Navy have built the F-3 battlecruisers instead of the Nelsons? Well, for those of you who are unaware, the F-3s were one of the two possible designs that the Royal Navy considered before settling on the Nelson class for their Washington Treaty uh, allocated tonnage. Now, the Nelsons were not part of the F design series. The F design series followed on from the G series. They were battle cruisers, whereas the Nelsons were developments of the O3, which were in turn obviously followed on from the N3. And so the Nelsons came out as battleships. Now, the the primary difference, as you can probably tell from these sketches, is that you've got different turret arrangement. Um, the Nelsons had the, the B turret super firing, whereas the F3s had uh, C turret super firing, but also in terms of gun calibre. So with the British designs that were going around at the time, two meant twin turrets. So F2 was six guns in three twins and F3 was nine guns in three triples. The British had pretty much locked on to the fact they were going to do triple turrets at this point. So F2 was more just a design consideration to see what could you buy for having three less guns. And it turns out a bit more speed, shockingly enough. Um, but F3 was a new kind of 15-inch gun. Still used the same shell as the other 15-inch guns, which would have afforded a great deal of compatibility. And it was designed for around about 28 knots, maybe 29 knots on a good day. So pretty, pretty nippy. Um, but interestingly, its armor scheme, whilst thinner than the Nelson's armor, it's only 12 inches thick, was quite heavily inclined. It was inclined 18 degrees off of the vertical, which is interesting because... 12 inches of armour at 18 degrees is only a degree or two off of the Iowa's armour protection, which is exactly the same thickness, just at, let's say, 19 or 20 degrees, depending on which source you're looking at and which part of the ship you're looking at, as far as I understand as well. So, armour protection-wise, you can't argue too much that it's a bad design decision. Um, and to be perfectly honest, with hindsight... Yes, they probably would have been better off building the F3s because that would have effectively given them a, between that level of protection and, you know, nine improved 15-inch guns and the speed. That basically would have given them a treaty-era fast battleship a decade and a half before anyone else built one, which would have put the British in a fairly interesting position come the 1930s and when they have to start building new warships especially because by that point the only type of shell and the only gun caliber in the fleet would have been the 15 inch gun because 13.5 inches would have gone the way of the dodo at some point in the 20s and early 30s and without the nelsons being there or without the nelsons being o3 derivatives that these two might still have been called nelson and rodney uh, but without having an o3 derivative with a 16 inch gun equipped there would be a lot more incentive to build the king george the fifths with three triple 15s as well which could have changed a few things here and there now, at the time, in context, it's relatively easy to see why they went with the Nelsons. Nagato and Mutsu, as well as the Colorado class, all had 16-inch guns. And so, you know, you'd think, okay, maximum armor protection, and the Nelsons do have sloped armor as well, but it's considerably thicker. 
and having 16 inch guns in it as well so they've got the same caliber of guns as the biggest ships in the other navies and the nelsons are a bit faster than the colorados almost as fast as the nagatos you can see the logic behind the nelsons for that particular period of time but i think if they'd had a bit more time to think about it overall i think they might have gone with the f3s and certainly the the f3s would have been a little bit more useful in uh, the world war ii period i mean it'd be interesting to see to be honest for example if if the f3s were built well they're, they're sort of big even bigger faster battle cruisers well not faster they're but more heavily armed than hood so once again you might circle back to does hood get refitted or not quite as heavily worn because you now have five battle cruisers instead of three and also would one or or both of those ships have been available to go after bismarck at the battle of denmark strait instead of hood who knows rotorex asks you mentioned torpedo nets being carried deployable along the side of the ship could you expand on this how common was it why didn't it continue how effective was it in general and compared to emplaced nets in terms of how common it was from the late 19th century through world war one it was pretty much universal on any ship of any substantial size as for why it didn't continue there were a number of issues one of which was you know having a massive amount of steel netting and the booms etc associated with being able to deploy them did add a lot of weight to the exterior of the ship that was useless in any other circumstance other than defending yourself against torpedoes and you couldn't run with the nets out and also run the ship and maneuver the ship at full battle speed so it was a case of you could maybe have the torpedo nets deployed when you were moving slowly and definitely when you're in harbour, but in a full-on battle where you might have, you know, destroyers running around with torpedoes and everything, you were very unlikely to be able to actually deploy them. So they became a much more of a passive defence for stationary ships than an active one. Secondly, torpedoes were getting faster and heavier, and they also had started development on tor a torpedo net cutter tips for the torpedoes. So you had instances during world war ii of ships with torpedo nets deployed being destroyed because the torpedoes in one way or another just forced their way through the torpedo nets anyway so they weren't having all that much effect so you had if it was effectively a way to slow you down and make you less agile thus making you a better torpedo target and that method didn't actually protect you from torpedoes and made your ship heavier and more susceptible to lots of flying debris if it was hit on the side so why on earth would you have this especially considering that you know deeper torpedo defense systems and torpedo bulges were in the process of being developed and in some cases deployed on ships now you could of course upgrade the torpedo nets to be even stronger and to be therefore be able to withstand the incoming torpedoes but that would make everything a lot heavier which would not only have a more deleterious effect on your ability of maneuvering and your speed in general but also obviously increase the overall weight penalty on the ship torpedo nets did make something of a comeback on a few ships mostly merchant ships during the second world war but even then they weren't completely successful the thing was a dock based land based shore based whatever you want to call it torpedo net system such as the one deployed around tirpitz for example or some of the ones deployed in other harbours to protect ships when it was in place as a permanent feature of a harbour or a mobile feature of a harbour you could make that torpedo net considerably heavier considerably more durable and therefore legitimately able to protect the ships from torpedoes so given that you weren't going to be deploying torpedo nets when you were moving at speed anyway it made more sense to just remove them from the ships and fit them purely to the places where the ships were going to be at a time and place where the ships would have otherwise deployed nets i.e basically harbour and that way the ship could be lighter it had less clutter attached to it and the ships got a superior protection anyway at least assuming that no one snuck through the nets paul trigger asks did the switch from a combined sail and steam propulsion to steam only 
come with a new hull form? In some ways, yes. The thing that switching over to Steam only allowed was that you could have a hull form that was considerably lower in the water, considerably less freeboard, and also longer and narrower generally, because masts and sails sticking high up above the ship would induce a significant healing motion in anything other than running before the wind and so a ship with particularly low freeboard like mm, captain um, would end up being rolled over and sunk pretty easily and in addition to that because of the additional weight up top and you know the, the general movement left and right it also meant that you needed a relatively speaking wide hull form for the, for a given beam in or for a given length sorry in order to allow the ship to not roll over just generally anyway regardless of how high the freeboard was removing the not just not the mast entirely but removing the sails and most of the masts and fittings meant that you could have this l longer narrower and much lower ship which was fairly important for the era when they were having to pile on truly insane amounts of iron armor to try and make sure that the ships could you know stay protected against their own guns and guns that their enemies might try and use against them so in a way yes it allowed for a new hull form but it wasn't a case that all steamships immediately took on that hull form there are plenty of uh, steam ships that you can look at which look almost identical to masted vessels of the period, just, you know, without the full mast and sail rig. Because that whole form was still perfectly viable. In fact, it was hilariously stable and very seaworthy when you took away the sails and just stuck some engines in the bottom. But it did come with a few design compromises, like, you know, for especially for a line of battle warship, high sides mean, meant a lot of vulnerable area, to incoming shells if you're having to use 18 to 24 inches of armor and the shorter uh, length to breadth ratio meant that the steam power couldn't move you quite as quickly either so there were compromises to it but occasionally you would see that those kinds of vessels as well and then everything gets even more confusing because you also include ships that were designed with a combined power plant but were then later converted to steam only which look very, very much like sail-powered ships, because basically they are, just with the sails taken off. Andy Smith asks, In the much-publicised photo of the Japanese cruiser Mikuma burning after Midway, there are some cylindrical protrusions on the side. They resemble torpedoes, but they look way too massive. What exactly is going on? Well, here's the photo, and as you can see there, just uh, aft of the funnel, on the port side there are some rather large objects poking out the side. These are in fact the ship's torpedo launchers and the reason why it might look a little bit too large to be a torpedo is that well it's not torpedoes it's the entire launch system so you've got multiple torpedo launcher tubes except that because of the angle of the camera that we're viewing this this ship from you get effectively a doubling or tripling up of what you're seeing so obviously the container to launch the torpedo must by default be la larger than the torpedo itself and then when you have a bunch of them effectively from this perspective stacking up on top of each other especially on the forwardmost launcher unless you get a really high-res copy and zoom right in it looks like a massive tube as you can see considerably larger than the guns of the ship but that is actually just a series of torpedo launcher tubes just looked at from a slightly odd angle. And then the slightly closer launcher, it appears from that that the entire launch tube has detached from the launcher and is just hanging on at the back by the skin of its teeth and hanging down. And what you've got above is just the, the, the sort of the top cover, if you like, of the torpedo launch system because that's fairly unlikely to be a, a long lance just hanging off there. It's, it's more likely a tube, which probably has a long lance in it, quite possibly, but there you go. Pico and Titanic asks, In reference to naval miniature gaming, what use or importance is having destroyers or light cruisers? 
Also, can you recommend any good books on World War One era battle cruisers? So, if you want to learn about battle cruisers of World War One, if you want a single sort of primer book that will give you a reasonably detailed background as well as some fairly important technical details of individual ships, then British and German battle cruisers, their development and operations by Michel Cosentino is a pretty good one to go for. Um, also, Ruggiero Stronglini, I think, is the other co-author there. If, however, you want to look at the two sides effectively for World War One, the British and Ger um, German battle cruisers in isolation, then I can recommend German battle cruisers of World War One, their design, construction, and operations by Gary Staff. And paradox, because it might sound, the British battleship 1906 to 1946 by Norman Friedman, or British battleships of, uh, I forget exactly what the title is, it's either of World War One or covering a date period by um, R.A. Burt both of which are titled British Battleships, but both of which also contain extensive information on the battle cruisers. So those would be my recommendations there. As far as why you use destroyers or light cruisers in a naval miniatures war game, for pretty much the same reasons that you'd use them in real life. They're fast, they provide good scouting in a war game where perhaps you can see exactly where your opponent is on the tabletop and you don't necessarily need good scouting, they're still quick, they still pack a lot of torpedoes which, you know, will pack a fair bit of punch. They're relatively cheap, so you can get a number of them on the board for any compared to the price of a single battleship. And of course they provide good screening against your opponent trying to have to do the same thing to you. Of course it can be very tempting just to put together a nice big battle line of four or five capital ships and run that in at the enemy but anyone who knows anything about what they're doing who has a slightly more balanced force should assuming that the game system is anything close to being realistic be able to then flank you and send some very very unpleasant fish your way Billy Anazari asks, why are there no British battleships with triple barrel main gun turrets except for the Nelsons? Three main reasons, and that broadly divides things up into the three main building periods for battleships, or at least dreadnought battleships. In the early part, so from HMS Dreadnought through to the beginning of World War I, the British were a bit more focused than everybody else on going to the biggest calibre possible at the time. So 12 inch to 13.5 to 15 um, and so forth, whereas everyone else was sort of 11, 12 inch and then begrudgingly perhaps moving on to a 13 point something or a 14. That in turn meant that for any given era of ship design, and bearing in mind, eras of ships are passing with every two or three years at this point. Having a twin turret with these very large guns, like, say, a twin 15-inch turret, was about as big as you could practically get on that hull. If you wanted a triple, you'd have to go down in size. Like, well, the Americans didn't go down in size from a 15, but on a similar size hull to the Queen Elizabeth, they got triple 14s instead of twin 15s. So that's one consideration. The other consideration in that period is that triple turrets were quite difficult to get right. They were a brand new thing. And so some nations who really needed to push the boat out on innovation did go for them and did make them work. For the British, however, between the fact that, you know, a slightly messed up triple turret design could ruin an entire class of battleships right in the middle of a building war with Germany... And the fact they wanted the bigger guns meant that they stuck with the twins. Now, during the First World War itself, this is where a lot of triple turret designs began to mature. Problems were being fixed by um, the nations that had built triples and found issues with them. But, of course, the British weren't building any battleships during World War One, apart from completing the ones that had already laid down. And so kind of a British equivalent to the New Mexico's or something like that was never uh, really even go got to the detailed design stage, let alone actually being built. 
once and so that kind of wraps up era one then you get into era two which is the late part of world war one and then the early interwar period especially the washington treaty period and this is the period that gives us the nelsons but this is the period in which the british really have embraced the triple turret there is a battle cruiser design that goes in between the admiral class and the design lineage for the washington naval treaty battle cruiser 1919 that probably has triple turrets all the design lineage of british battle cruisers and battleships during the washington treaty period all also include a triple turreted option a lot of them include a twin turreted option as well but in almost every single case when they analyzed it they found the triple turret version one out and the n3s and the g3s were going to have triple turrets then you end up with the nelsons because they were the only things that survived then when you go through the interwar period so that kind of is begin and wraps up an, another relatively brief era but once you're going into the interwar and then world war ii period some british designs are loaded with triple turrets others are loaded with twin 16s and others are loaded with other interesting varieties of gun armament depending on what displacement they're looking at Indeed, one of the early design studies for the King George V uses triple 15s of a new type, but they eventually decided to go with quad 14s to give them the maximum possible firepower, given that they are trying to drop the calibre limit to 14 inches in the London Naval Treaty Part 2. Uh, then they end up with two quads and a twin because they're trying to play exactly to the weight, but that's another story entirely. And then, of course, they lay down the Lion class at the end of the 1930s, which also have triple turrets, but they are also not completed thanks to World War II. So there are a lot of British designs, including a number that were either seriously put forward to be produced or were actually in the process of being produced, all with triple turrets. But, you know, time and unforeseen circumstances hit them all. Matt Kidd asks, what's the deal with Mr. Hollum singing with the crew in Master and Commander? Did he do something wrong? Everyone acts like he like he did, but the guy was just singing. What's the big deal? It's a combination of two things, one of which is that in the movie he is already being seen by the crew as something of a bad luck um, token, so you know, sailors at the time, and to be honest, even today, somewhat suspicious lot, a superstitious lot so having someone who is known for bringing bad luck at least in their minds coming up and trying to join in with your activities it's not really something you want but on top of that specifically with uh, him he's a midshipman so he is an officer admittedly he's the lowest grade of officer but an officer still and especially in the society of the time and the naval society of the time of hms surprise and the master and commander era the officers do not fraternize with the crew they are supposed to be separate the officers dine with the officers they speak with the officers they spend their off-duty time with the officers they do not start acting like one of the crew apart from anything else um it does run into issues where if a low-ranking officer acts as if if he just is one of the crew then a, some of the crew might then start thinking well why why do we take orders from him if he's exactly the same as us except he has a fancy hat what what authority does that give him don't tell xkcd i said that um but anyway it, it was a serious from the societal social class issues and the issues of rank as well they were even more entrenched back then than they are today and i mean even today you know you don't ha you don't have senior officers addressing ratings privates ensigns depending on what part of the military you're in by their first names and things like that because it's not seen as conducive to a good command structure and back then when the difference between midshipmen and you know, uh, someone who was just a general crewman would be the, how many times could you fail your lieutenant's exam it was a very fine balance to maintain so when it comes to the the crew and him singing they're basically looking at him in 
looking at him like, what the heck are you doing? Why are you here? You shouldn't be here. This is our space. This is the space for the crew, not the space for the officers. You're an officer. You should be doing officer things, not trying to pretend that you're one of us because you aren't. And pretending to be is actually something of an insult to everybody's intelligence, so stop it. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Oak Tree asks, assuming there's no large-scale canal building done in the 19th or early 20th centuries, i.e. no sewers, keel, or Panama canals, how does this impact naval construction considerations, alternate basing construction, and fleet size and composition decisions for the major naval powers? All three have very different implications, but they're all very major ones. The Kiel Canal, if it's not built, has the biggest effect on the German Navy. Doesn't really have an effect on anybody else because the Germans wouldn't let anybody else use it for military purposes during war, which is relatively understandable. But by not having the Kiel Canal, Germany's shipbuilding, basing efforts and her strategic mobility are all significantly impacted. So if she wants to build ships as fast as shipyards can build them, then she's going to have to decide, are we maintaining a Baltic fleet and a North Sea fleet, in which case that diminishes the overall strength of both, or are we building all our ships in all our possible uh, shipyards, but then we're sending them up and around Denmark? That allows you to build up a very strong fleet in one or the other area, but of course it means you then have little to no strength in whichever area you've denuded of shipping, which, given that they were potentially squaring off against Russia, could be a problem if the Baltic's left uncovered, but equally if they build a strong fleet to counter Russian efforts in the Baltic, then French or British efforts in the North Sea would go less challenged. And on top of that, you know, yeah, you could think, well, going around Denmark is not exactly a particularly long way, so you could redeploy, but it means everyone knows where you're going to have to redeploy. And the area between Denmark and Sweden is absolutely perfect for an ambush by submarines and small torpedo craft, and the exit from uh, going around Denmark, or potentially trying to get uh, into the Straits, is a perfect place to ambush you if you if the opponent has a very large fleet. So it would cause all sorts of major issues for Germany if Germany then decided it wanted to try and build up a, a very large fleet the way that it did historically in the run-up to World War I. Without the Suez Canal, the entire balance of almost everybody's fleets, with the possible exception of the Americans and Japanese, changes because without the Suez Canal, the Mediterranean is, for better or worse, a little bit of a dead end. It's an incredibly important theatre of operations if you happen to be at war with the Ottomans, the Italians, the French, and that's about it. The Russians are up in the Baltic anyway, so they don't particularly care. Um, they've got their Black Sea fleet as well but the Black Sea access is controlled by the Dardanelles which brings you back to the Ottomans it it does somewhat restrict Russia's strategic mobility and the other Mediterranean access powers strategic mobility if they want to head east but let's be fair most of them apart from the French didn't really have any far eastern possessions and without the amount of trade that's using the rather obvious shortcut to get from Europe or America through to India or the Far East, it's just not as strategically important as say, outside of a specific war with a specific Mediterranean power. You could argue that also reduces the strategic importance of Gibraltar to a certain extent, albeit that Gibraltar still serves to divide things like the French Navy in two, and there's still a fair bit of trade going on in the Mediterranean anyway, and it's a good base to hit convoys that would now be trying to go down the western side of Africa but yeah it would be possibly somewhat reduced it would be more of a gateway to the Mediterranean rather than a choke point of a significant amount of world trade but overall you might see the number of warships in the Mediterranean actually significantly reduce because without the sheer amount of trade going on 
as I say, it's less important, so various navies in the Mediterranean will feel less of a need to build up those navies. And other navies that have a presence in the Mediterranean, like the Royal Navy, well, if, you know, the late in the late 19th century, if the Italians are not building up their navy as much, the Ottomans are maybe not building the navy up as much, the French Toulon squadron is probably not quite as strong, well, then there's not as much need to make the Mediterranean fleet so big and powerful as it was historically. So that would probably be the effect of that. The Panama Canal is probably the biggest one for naval construction considerations. Suez and Kiel both have depth limits. And in World War II, at least, the depth limits of the Kiel Canal did have some effect on German ship design. But it's not anywhere near as much of an impact as the Panama Canal's width restrictions are because you can always lighten a ship and indeed that's for the Suez Canal quite often ships would light artificially lighten themselves before entering and then stock up on whatever it was whether it be food water fuel etc that they'd taken off at the other end but Panama makes a huge difference I mean from a strategic point of view by not having the Panama Canal as a potential access from the Pacific to the Atlantic, it then means that going around Tierra del Fuego is the only way to cross ships over one way or the other, which will significantly increase the strategic value of that area. So Chile and Argentina will probably get a little bit more interested. Um, the British base on the in the Falklands probably becomes a lot more important. And for the US they face an even bigger version of the problems that the Germans would face without the Kiel Canal, and pretty much a problem that Mahan was pointing out and was experienced during the Spanish-American War. It takes an awful long time to get from one coast to the other. So rather than having a navy that overall is as powerful or almost as powerful as any other in a particular theatre, and then being able to have it scattered in peacetime between the Pacific and Atlantic coasts, the US Navy would be forced to make a decision of who do we think our most likely rival is. We're going to have to have our Navy based on that coast primarily. And in the event of war with the other power, we just have to hope tensions don't rise too quickly because we're going to have to transition everything and we're going to have, hope, have to hope that our primary initial threat consideration doesn't take the advantage of it because it's going to take a month or two to reallocate all our shipping, um, which you know would be a problem. It would also probably force the major development of Pacific shipyards and bases as well. Uh, so they'd have to match the output of the East Coast shipyards and bases purely for logistical reasons. And that would probably have to be the choice the US Navy would make because for the majority of the time it's not got the funding to afford to have a Navy big enough to hold off the Royal Navy based on the Atlantic coast and a Navy big enough to dominate the Pacific on the Pacific coast. For a very brief period in the late 1910s, early 1920s it had that funding. And obviously, as you, after the naval treaties, it well, it still doesn't have that funding because it's matching based on numbers overall. But maybe by the late 1930s, they get that kind of funding. But the majority of the time, it would be a case of we can either match Britain in the Atlantic. And we have basically no defense against Japan or we can overwhelm Japan in the Pacific, but we have no defence if Britain suddenly decides it wants to uh, reoccupy the 13 colonies. And that might actually force the US to make some interesting decisions about allying itself with people in pre-war periods, rather than waiting for the war itself to break out. Miko Leitnan asks, are the two Admiral Cunninghams of World War II Royal Navy fame somehow related? And did they manage to operate so close? And how did they manage to operate so closely without causing significant amounts of confusion? Admirals John and Andrew Cunningham uh, are in fact not related, believe it or not. Um, they're from two completely separate families, uh, at least as far back as any kind of genealogy is relevant. And yes, they both served in World War II, although Andrew Cunningham, which is the one you usually hear about, was by far the senior admiral. And as far as operating without causing much confusion, they had a degree of luck in as much as 
for the early and mid-war, Andrew Cunningham was in charge of the Mediterranean fleet, and obviously fairly successful at that, whilst John Cunningham was operating pretty much anywhere but the Mediterranean, North Sea, Atlantic, West Coast of Africa, etc., etc. However, there was a small potential for confusion because once Andrew Cunningham moved off to become First Sea Lord and thus left the Mediterranean, his immediate successor as Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean fleet was John Cunningham. So, effectively for the entire war, with a very slight interruption at one point in the early part of the war when Admiral Harwood was briefly in charge, the Mediterranean fleet spent its entire war under the command of an Admiral Cunningham, one way or the other. Paul from Chicago asks, did the adventure class and her daughters have more in common with or develop from second or third class protected cruisers? And did the towns and Arethusas draw from the scouts or something else? The adventure class and the other Royal Navy scout cruisers are a little bit of a weird mix because they are faster by a considerable margin than their contemporary second and third class protected cruisers by about five-ish knots. Whilst that doesn't sound them in particularly brilliant instead for World War I, um, they are still fast for their time. Now, this means that you have ships whose hull form and overall dimensions displacement more closely resemble a second class protected cruiser, because they need the space for the engines, but in terms of armament, three inch and four inch guns, they are spot on armament wise for third class protected cruisers and their protection is pretty much the same as well so if you are going to pick one or the other for them to draw on i'd say they're drawing more on the third class protected cruisers than they are on the seconds they're effectively third class protected cruisers with second class hull sizes to allow them to get up to speed then you get to the arith users which are kind of the the last in the line they're not usually attached although they are scout cruisers they're not usually attached to the adventure class and its descendants purely because the arith users have belt armor as well as deck armor so to a certain degree they fall into the light armored cruiser category even though that is a hilariously bad category for them to exist in Um, they're effectively the evolution of the scout cruiser into the modern more modern era where cruisers are expected to have some form of belt protection the town class however and for those of you confused we're not talking about the um, six six inch gun arith users and the uh, 12 six inch gun towns of the 1930s we're talking helpfully (laughs) about the arith users and town class of the 1910s and so yeah the the arith users they're the final development of the scout cruiser at least as far as the royal navy is concerned um, but drawing on some of the lessons of putting putting belts on to cruisers the town class are not that they're not developments of the arith users they're initially classed as second class cruisers because they have the armament of a second class cruiser i.e some six inch guns and a bunch of four inch guns Whereas the first class protected cruisers, which to be fair have, at that point hadn't been built for a while, are much more heavily armed. But they, the the towns, are very much light armored cruisers in mo- many senses of the word. They're armored cruisers in as much as they have belt armor, but they are also quote unquote, light armored cruisers in that they do follow the armoured cruiser pattern of weaponry, which is you know a few big guns fore and aft, and then secondary guns down the sides, and that is pretty much what the towns are um, when, they're, when they're initially constructed. Of course, that then leads on to the C-class and some later variants of the towns where they start to go more towards what we'd recognise as the proto-light cruiser, uh, but that is much of a muchness for later on. Tyler Dunn asks, what were the US alternatives for the Orlikon 20mm and Bofors 40mm guns? So with the 20mm, it was actually a pretty easy decision to make. They needed them much more urgently to replace 50 cal machine gun mounts. And there was already a fairly extensive body of experience coming across the Atlantic from the British who were already adopting the 20mm Orlikon. 
So there was a brief period of consideration by the Bureau of Ordnance in 1940 as to whether to go with the Orlikon, which at this point would be a new weapon, or whether to adopt a navalised version of the Hispano Suzuya 20mm, which was already in use in aircraft in the US. Now, obviously, there'd be a certain amount of attraction to using the Hispano Suzuya because it would mean having a single 20mm weapon across all services, common ammunition, common spare parts, etc. But the problem was the Hispano Suzuya was an excellent weapon for an aircraft. It was lightweight, it was air-cooled, which is not a problem when you're trucking around at 300 plus miles an hour, and any issues that might result from its magazine ammunition feed or propensity to overheat firing it for long periods of time didn't really matter in the air. But the fact it was in no way, shape or form navalized at that point, so it was vulnerable to salt water cor corrosion and under extended periods of firing, it did tend to, to overheat and jam, like, you know, 30, 40 second bursts that might be done in air defense of a ship, pretty much immediately sent the Orlikon to the front runner position and the only position. Um, the fact that the British were begging the Americans to make more of them for the UK use as well, it didn't exactly hurt the situation. Whereas when it came to replacing the 28 mil 1.1 inch Chicago piano, obviously everyone, well, most people know it, there was a bit of a competition between the 40 mil Bofors and the two pounder pom pom that the Royal Navy used. But they also considered the 37 millimeter gun that the army had, uh, which amongst other things would feature in things like the Aero Cobra uh, fighter. But the 37mm had a lot of the same issues that the Hispano Suzuya 20mm did. It just was not easily adaptable for naval use right off the bat. And so the competition came down very quickly to do we go with a 40mm pom-pom or do we go with 40mm bofors? And as I've covered in other questions, the bofors won out just about. And finally, Jellico Cat's Get Confused at Night asks, Stan Rogers' song Barrett's Privateers contains the line, Barrett was smashed like a bowl of eggs and the main truck carried off both me legs. What is a main truck? How many trucks would a sloop have? And what determines which one is the main truck? How big is it? Could it carry off both the man's legs? And if so, under what circumstances is this likely to happen? So there's two possibilities here. Um, guns were mounted on what meant well some people call carriages other people call trucks and in the time period these little four-wheeled uh, things so on a small ship like a sloop it's possible that you might have a single larger main gun so you might have four six eight nine twelve pounders on the side depending on exactly the size of the ship but you might have a slightly heavier bow chaser and that might be a 12 18 or 24 pounder something like that and in that case, um, then the truck for that gun, obviously having to be a bit bigger and a bit heavier, might be referred to as the main truck. And given the context of the part of the song that it's in, when the ship's in, shall we say, something of a distressed condition, if that breaks loose, you can absolutely guarantee that a heavy gun truck running over your legs will take will take off both your legs, or at least mash them up badly enough that you will wish they'd been taken off. The other, and in this case possibly slightly more likely scenario, is there was one other thing on the ship that was called a main truck, because the main truck that I just described would be a, an informal or colloquial designation, whereas something that was definitively the main truck would be at the very top of the, the ship's main mast there would be a very thick banding possibly wood possibly iron possibly a combination of the two depending on exactly which ship you're talking about and the exact time period within the age of sail but the main function of that is to carry uh, lines as it's the, the top mounting point for a number of lines and parts of the rigging and it's also there to keep the at the top of the mast from getting weather worn and to keep it all together because obviously if you just have an exposed mast top then the rain coming down is going to get down into the into the wood um, because obviously it's now going parallel with the grain and then you're going to get the top of your mast splitting and that's not good so but in any case whether it's wood iron or a combination of both it's a very 
strong, very heavy disc of material. And given that the context of the verse around it is that the ship is apparently going over on its side, then it's possible that someone has been chucked into the water and is swimming away. And then as the ship comes down, either the some part of the mast is shot away or the entire ship rolls over and the mast goes with the ship. At which point, yeah, yeah if it's either dropping or rotating from that kind of height, something like that acting as a massive great club effectively would pretty much take your legs off if it managed to catch them you at that point you'd well very very briefly be thanking all the powers that be that it didn't just pulverize you completely i.e it hit a few feet short for that you'd probably also be cursing them by the fact you got hit in the first place and then you'd probably have blood loss and hypothermia so it wouldn't matter too much in any case so there's a cheerful note to end the dry dock on and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock um, not a tremendous amount of channel admin to talk about at the moment, uh, other than to say very briefly that Skillshare have offered me a rolling sponsorship. So for the next few months, there'll be one video per month that will have a Skillshare um, sponsorship thing in it. Um, hopefully that won't be too intrusive. It'll be in the same kind of manner as I've done before, but I'll give you a heads up that those are upcoming all that be it you know if you're watching all of my videos you've only got to put up with it with what one in every dozen so hopefully that won't be too bad um then we've got my hopeful us trip so i'm now going to i've now kind of set in my mind i'm going to try and aim for a three-week trip probably in early to mid april I thought maybe, maybe about starting at the end of March, but then I realised that plan was predicated on um, taking advantage of UK bank holidays and stuff for annual leave. But since obviously I now work for myself, I can grant myself leave whenever I like, which is great, <laughs> even though, you know, it is kind of a working trip. So I'm not technically going on leave um, anyway. So probably early to mid April, three weeks. I'll be revising the schedule and the exact dates and everything based on one, I don't have to work myself completely ragged like I was going to before. And two, obviously I want to coordinate with the museum ships that I'm visiting to make sure that everything works out nicely. Um, I'm in obviously planning it, but I'm not going to 100% say this is a definitive schedule, this is what I'm doing, because one, I don't have it sorted anyway, and two, Obviously, the travel to the US is set to reopen in November, but based on, you know, the last two years, I'm not going to put anything down on paper until uh, they actually do reopen, um, and then I'll be a bit more confident. So ESTA visa application, etc. will have to go in in November, December and hopefully get it all sorted for April. So that's that. Um, other than that, 250k subscriber competition, I don't know what's going on with that i put the post up in uh, last sunday and in theory people should have seen it but a couple of people messaged me to say they couldn't see it and it doesn't had any response either so i don't i can see it um i don't know why any no one else can but hopefully by the time you're listening to this that should have been resolved one way or the other either i'll have figured out why it's not showing and it'll just pop up or i'll have given up deleted it and reposted um the same thing again in any case, hopefully that will sort that out, and uh, thanks very much. See you in another video.